recording in progress. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, if somebody could type in the uh, chat, just let me know that you can hear me okay in Zoom land. That would be fantastic. Super. Awesome. Looks like we've got a good turnout on Zoom, so that's good. I'm going to jump right in and try to respect everybody's time. I know everybody is uh, taking a little time out of their evening, but we're going to try to cover a lot of information. Uh, there, if you have any questions on Zoom, if you could unmute yourself and just ask me to stop and then ask your question that way, that would be very helpful. Another thing is for, uh, to aid me in getting information to people, if you could type your name and email address in the chat, that way we'll capture that with the recording and I'll be able to send information out if uh, we need any information sent out at a later time about what we talk about tonight. Tonight, we're gonna be focusing on present and I've got us pulled up here to the hub, which is where we always uh, start when we go into Moxie. Uh, the American Realty dot team is how you get to Moxie. The American Realty dot team. Uh, that's how you get to Moxie. You'll log in and it'll, then you'll come to the hub. Just a couple of things on hub I always like pointing out are the tech support tab up here to the top left that you can go to that will uh, allow you to contact me for tech support. The widget down at the bottom left, which will uh, open up if you click on it and allow you to enter information about uh, your issue that you're having with Moxie, and I can uh, respond back to that because it will create a ticket. And also, if you scroll down a little ways, then there's a technical support link here, which takes you to the different ways to contact me for technical support. The easiest way is always to send a uh, email to support at the American Realty Tech. That's the American Realty Tech, T E C K uh, T E C H, and that'll be the best way to uh, get in touch with me. Usually, that automatically creates a that automatically creates a ticket for me and uh, lets me know that you've got something that I need to address. Okay, so tonight we're going to be going into present. So from our hub, you'll choose present across the top menu bar. It's your second option. 
before engage. And present may have a little lag in getting started. So just know that may happen. And when present opens, it will open in presentations that you have already made, or it will have a sample presentation in there uh, that was created when we were doing the testing and everything. So just know that that will be in there. If you're on a team, you will have the second tab and that will be where presentations will be that you've created that are for uh, the different people in your team. So just know those are different ways to look at that. So in order to create a presentation, you know, present is a valuable tool that creates what in effect is a nice CMA that you can give to your customer. And as we go through this, you'll see all the details that are in it. And it actually is a very good way to present the information about the property they're selling or buying uh, to them. But we'll start by clicking Create New over here to the right-hand side. And that'll pull up a new presentation window and give you a choice of restarting my app. Apparently, it'll give you a choice of the different presentation types that are available through Moxie Present. The top one here is for a buyer. The second one is for a seller. The third is for a buyer tour. And the last one is for a non-listing. We'll touch base on the non-listing buyer tour as we go along. But seller is where we're going to start tonight. The reason I'm going to start with seller is because that's probably a lot of what we're going to be dealing with and the functionality of seller and buyer are almost identical. So just know that that will be uh, a good way to interchange information between the two. So if you click on seller and then click continue, it pulls up an area here where you can create your presentation from no template, or you can use the default seller template that is already in the system. These have already been worked on by Amanda, they are um, very well put together and they include a number of pages that uh, allow you to give your, your customer a very good idea of what they will be dealing with if they're selling or buying. You've also got this drop down that says brokerage templates. If you click that there, you've got my templates you can pick from or brokerage templates. As you create, you can actually save your own templates so if there are special pages you want to add uh, or special pages you want to remove and you don't want to have to do that every time, you can save it as a template. Once you've selected the template you want to use or the lack of template, hit continue. And this asks you to enter a name um, for who this presentation is prepared for. If you only have a first name or a last name because you've got limited information, you can put that there or you can put the address. I'm just going to put test presentation. And then you'll notice here it, it counts down how many characters I have left. You only have 85 characters in this title. So just make, make be aware that you can't type um, a lot of information in there. The next thing on this window is your MLS uh, listing source. For many of us, it'll be Georgia MLS as our primary that will appear here. And what this does is it pulls your primary from your profile. So if you are actually wanting to use Lake Country or Athens or Middle Georgia, you have to change that in your profile to your default MLS. And then when you come here, it'll be listed as your primary. And you'll be able to create using the comps that are uh, particular to that MLS. I'm going to leave it as Georgia MLS because that's my primary, and I'm going to click Create down the bottom right. It seems to be acting up a little bit tonight, requiring me to do things twice in some instances, so just bear with me. It's been kind of acting up today, I've noticed. So we'll get there. Once you click create, it'll take a moment for it to do 
its thing because it is loading a lot of information in the background. So just know that it'll take a minute, but it will eventually come up. All right. So when you get into your presentation, you start with the subject property. And if you look where my cursor is up here in the top left, you'll see this breadcrumb bar that allows you to see the steps that you will go through when creating this presentation. You'll always start with subject property. And as you complete these and hit continue down here to the bottom, it will take you to the next one in the list. So we're pretending that this is an expired listing that we've called on, that we've got a meeting with. So we're putting together a presentation, a CMA on this particular property. I've already looked one up. So you enter the MLS number here if you want to, if you've got it, and then you can click copy. If you don't have it, you come down here and you'll enter information in various areas as you go through. In some instances, if you're dealing with a for sale by owner, you may only have the information from Zillow or uh, Realtor.com or one of those others. So you may have to come in and fill in a lot of this information yourself. The good thing is if the property has ever been on MLS, you can use that MLS number. Um, so I've pulled this MLS number for an expired property and I click copy after that. And what's happened, what happens is it pulls the image from the MLS. The first image of the MLS will be placed here. It'll enter the address information and any other information that it pulls from MLS. You'll notice that this is a two bedroom, one bath, 1800 square feet on 47 acres, shows the tax amount. All this information was in, in MLS. When it pulls remarks from MLS, just know that it always puts this huge space in there. I like to remove that just so when I print things or present them to my client, it doesn't have that odd spacing to it. It will also pull in the current status of that listing. So that listing number, that current status of expired, the list price that it was at, and how long it was on the market. Once you've got that in there and all the information you want to use, you scroll down to the bottom and click continue. Give it a second to work. You'll notice the address will pop in here. And one thing you may or may not have is results pop in down here underneath the address. What happens is it takes the information that it pulled in from MLS or the information that you entered and it creates a search based on that information. A lot of times that information is highly specific, so you may not get as many comps as you want. So there, there, there are options for customizing this search and making it more um, broad so that it pulls in more result, results. You'll notice here to the right of the uh, address bar, you've got a price drop down where you can set a minimum or maximum price. If your client's got a price range, they're looking in and you don't want anything in that list higher or lower than um, their range. You can select that minimum, select that maximum, make sure you click apply, and that'll put that there in price. You've also got bed and bath. You'll notice what it did is it defaulted and basically selected a range that is usually one lower and one higher than the bedroom count on the property you are using for your subject property. And then with the baths, it does the same thing. It chooses one lower and one higher as the range for bed and bath. We're gonna leave that. We're gonna go over here to our filters. And when I click on filters, you'll see that this is where a lot of the information winds up populating. Square footage, 1,500 to 2,100. So it's limiting your search to that. You've also got other things down here that are limiting the search as well, as well as your bed and baths here. It's looking for active properties. You can also pull open houses if you want to look for those. It's also pulling sold if this is checked, but you can uncheck any of these that you want to. So I'm going to uncheck active 
because we're not going to be worrying about what's on the market. We're going to be worried about stuff that is either sold or pending. So we're going to take off market away, contingent away, expired, sale failed, canceled, and othered. And we're going to leave it as sold and pending for the last six months. We also have the ability of pulling short sale or bank up as part of our uh, part of our uh, filters as well. But you'll notice that we still have no information that's populated down here. So I'm going to go to filters. I'm going to click reset filters, and I'm going to reset it to defaults. Currently, it's set for subject property values. If you set it to defaults, you don't like what's there. You can always reset it to subject property values and go with that. But I'm going to reset it to defaults. Again, nothing pops up. My bed and my bed and bath, you'll notice, have also cleared. So let's see if we can't broaden this search and get something to pull in. It's looking for sold in the last six months, looking for pendings in the last um, 90 days. So there's obviously nothing around in that particular type. But I'm going to pull farm and land, uh, farm and ranch and land because this is a larger property. There may be something that is out there dealing with that. And there are none. So if that's the case, you have to start really digging in and searching and broadening your search. Now, the search is based on your map window over here. You have the ability to make this much wider so that it pulls information from a larger area around your subject property. You have the ability to draw a radius. So if you click on radius, click on your subject property and then drag out, it'll create a radius for whatever size you want to use. That's a 37.48 meter radius. So if you run that search, it'll run it within that radius area and see if there's anything in there. If there's not, and you want to just completely do away with that search, you'll notice this blue line coming across. It's doing a search for, for those properties now. And again, it's having to process a lot of data. So just know that it may take it a minute. Okay, so again, we found no information. What I'm going to do is I'm going to change out and go back to a different subject property. And I'm going to do a subject property that hopefully will have more comps. So you enter your MLS there, click copy. It'll say, do you want to replace the information? So in order to do that, you just say copy. Again, it pulls the new information, gives us all of that. Again, since we pulled the new one in, it put that odd space in there. So I'm backing that out. It continued. Hey, Adam, this is Kim. You're still doing all of this on the search? Yes, ma'am. Okay, can you just go back just a little bit to where you did the uh, comps and just show me where? That's what I'm getting to. Okay, okay, good, okay. So this is under search, and this is where we're looking for comparable properties um, related to this. Again, we've got our filters that were set when we pulled it in. Even though we had reset for the previous search, we're going to have to reset them for this search. We're going to reset it to defaults. We're also going to come over here and remove all the different things that we uh, removed the first time and remove active. Then we're going to apply that search. For some reason, it's having problems tonight. Let me refresh my screen, see if I can't get things to reload, and we'll start fresh um, with this. I apologize for the delay.
Okay, now it just needed to be woke up, that's all. So now that we've got it awake, we see that it's pulled some properties that are near uh, our subject property. Our filters will reset those because what I did before didn't save because I reset my, my browser. I'm also going to come back into my filters and I'm going to make sure that I take active out and I'm only going to look for sold and pendings, then apply that. And you'll notice my list keeps getting smaller as I go. And you'll notice that the green ones for actives go away, gold ones for pending, red ones for sold. And this is where you come through and you look for properties that are similar to your subject property. Okay, so if I go back to my subject property for a second, we can see that it's a 4 4 2900 square foot home. So if I come back to my search, I can look at these various properties and make a determination whether I want to pull these in based on their semblance and their, their similarity in size uh, or what they're offering. Some of these are good, some of them are bad, but I'm just picking at random right now to give us some to use. Another thing that you'll notice here is listings. The number beside listings changes. So as I select properties and as I include properties, listings goes up. As I remove a property, listing goes down. So one thing, if you are in here and you forget to add any listings to your selection and you go to your listings page thinking you're done, remember it doesn't have your listings in there, okay? You didn't add them from search. To add them from search, you hover over the particular picture and click the plus sign and it will add them to your search. And like I said, I'm just adding some to give us some to work with. My listings will go up to six. So I'll push listings. And this will take me over to my, comp my comparables that I selected. Right now, they're listed by this guideline, high to low. What Moxie gives you the ability to do is to select your order that you want them to appear in. So I'm going to put sold to active. That way it'll put my sold properties on top, my pending properties on the bottom. You see the way that worked there. And then if I hit this little plus, it allows me to select a secondary search or a secondary sort. So if I do that and go high to low, what that will do is it will sort by sold, pending, and active. And within the various categories, it will sort by price. So you'll notice my pendings are sorted by highest price to lowest price. And my sold, if there were more than those, would be the same way. Okay. So over here to the right, you see the listing summary. This shows you a list, a summary of the listings you have chosen. It gives you a low, an average, and a high for all of them for the pending ones and for the sold one. It also gives you a breakdown by different particulars and it sorts them the same way as they're sorted over here. So you've got your subject property in green, you've got your sold property and then all of your pending properties down below that. All sorted out nice for you for a quick uh, reference as to how they go out. Now, if you know of a property that is available that you do not see in this comp list, you have the ability to click here on add custom listing. And what that will do is it will load another window and allow you to enter the MLS number or the property information for that additional property. Okay, so just know that that is that does give you the ability to customize what you've got in this list a little bit more. And here's where it pulled it in. And you notice how it identifies it with the house with the little red um, here in the middle. So I'm just going to remove that because I didn't put anything in. Hit remove. 
It takes that one out of my list, leaves the other six, and I'm ready to go to my next step. The next step along the way is your estimate. What the estimate does is it pulls the price based on average sales and the price based on square footage for the subject property. It also gives the estimated market value based on this bet price on average sales, which is only the sold properties. So it defaults to that number. However, you can change this number, you can delete it, you can type your own number in there. But one thing that can be done is if that number is reasonable, then you can actually create a range around that number by clicking Create Range, entering a percentage here, and having it automatically count, calculate a range for you. Or you can actually type in the numbers that you want in your range. And then when you click apply, it puts them here. None of this that you're doing is permanent until you print it and it's actually printed on documentation. So just know that you can clear this range at any time. You can adjust this range at any time and make it appear or make it go the way you want it to look when you send it to your client. Remarks is a place where you can put information as to why you selected the pricing that you selected. Uh, this is where you can talk about appraisers, et cetera, and what they select and, and information like that. Uh, you can use this to your benefit uh, in any way possible because this will appear directly underneath that estimated market value when you print things up. I'm just going to put some test comments in there so you can see where it will appear later. Excuse me, Adam. Yes, ma'am. What is the purpose of this price estimate? Um, if you're dealing with a seller, you're going to want to give them an approximate range for them to list the home. Oh, I see. Okay. Now, that's what it's for. All right. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. I've always been taught you don't tell them a price, you give them a range. So, um, that's where you give them the range, or you just basically can clear the range, leave it blank, and let them do let them do what they want. Again, you've got your listing summary down here over to the left, which is identical to the way it was on the previous page, your listings page. And it's just a quick reference for the various properties and their statuses. Okay, so that's the estimated pricing part of the estimate. You'll also notice here that there's a tab that highlights that says estimated net proceeds. If I click on estimated net proceeds, it gives me the ability then to create an estimate for my seller on what their net proceeds could be based on a certain scenario. Moxie gives you the ability to create up to three scenarios for the net proceeds. This might be in the instance if they've got a home that needs some repairs, you could do one that estimated what their net proceeds would be if they did the repairs and one what their net proceeds would be if they didn't do the repairs, just to give them different things that they may be able to look at. But what you do is you create your first net proceed, proceed sheet, then to create your second, you click copy. It'll create another copy down below it, and you'll actually enter the information for it. And again, you can hit copy one more time for a total of three net proceed sheets. So I'm not going to use the net proceeds sheet. I'll show you where that appears when we get to the pages part. So I have a question. No, okay. So the next part we go to is the pages. And this is where we really start seeing our presentation come to light. The cover page is the default cover page and it defaults to the name that we put in there of who this was prepared for, the address, the date, as well as our information and the logo for the brokerage. There's an edit pencil here. So if I click on the edit pencil, it gives me the ability to change certain things on this particular cover page. I can change the title. I can remove the prepared for. I can remove the agent photo and info. I can remove the cover photo and add one to replace it. 
I can remove the address and I can remove the date. The good thing about leaving the date as here and selecting today, every time I go back to this presentation and send it to somebody new or send it to this seller, it will update that date with the current day. If I come over here to custom and type in or select a date, it locks that date on the day I, I, I create this the initial time. It will not update it dynamically. So just know that the today button is good uh, to leave selected. The web cover design, it's, you can actually select for it to mirror the PDF cover page. A lot of times you're, you're gonna have a better looking web cover design than you do on your PDF. So I usually leave that unchecked. And then the PDF cover, si cover design, you've got the ability to change from selected options that they have in their um, library. There are a select few that are available. And to select a different style, you just hit find the one you want, you hit select, and that will change it on the PDF only, not on the web view. Now, when you're doing this, you're actually creating a web view and you're creating a print view. So this is a sample of what the print view might look like. And then this is what your web view would look like by changing this little drop down. Okay. The next page that is available in the presentation is your property summary. This pulls up the property information that it was able to find in MLS or the information that you entered when you went through that subject property enter entry information earlier. That's where all this information is populated. Again, you're creating a web view and a print view when you do this. The next option is your listing location map page. And what this does is it shows the comps across the top with an arrow to change to additional ones if there are additional that run off the page. And it shows the actual locations of these comparables in relation to your subject property, which is marked with a circle, a blue circle and a white star. Notice that as you hover over an image, the price tag for that particular comparable highlights on the map. So you know where it is in relation to your subject property. This is fully interactive. So as your client is looking at like, looking at this on the web, I'll show you quickly what the web view looks like. This just gives you an idea of what the, the web view looks like. I'm not letting it load. I just wanted to get here. But this is what they will actually see when they look at this presentation on their phone or on their computer. And if they click on any of these properties, it will take them to that particular property information. So they're able to go through and look at it. They're able to see more of the pictures from MLS. It gives them a good idea of what that particular comp has to offer compared to their property. And it's a good, a good way to provide a good comparison for them to look at. Okay. You also have an edit pencil here. If you click on the edit pencil, the only thing that it gives you the option here is whether it puts this reference page on the print version. And by that, I mean it will put a dot here and it will put a page number on that dot and tell you which page number that particular comp is in the printed PDF version. The next page available is listing overview. Listing overview is simply a listing summary of all of your comps. And it pulls up so that they are interactive. They can click on these to go to them. And they can look at each one individually as they go through. This is also where a lot of times you wind up with a very large PDF when you're creating the print version. Let me show you what I'm talking about here. You've got 12 pages. It says here in this particular presentation now, but if I come and say, I want to view the print PDF, it will actually generate that PDF for me.
feel like the Jeopardy music should be playing. When it pulls the PDF up, it will load it in, and it's pretty obvious this is going to be a pretty large PDF because it's taken a minute to load the document. But what you'll see is when it loads the PDF, that there will actually be many more than 12 pages. Boxy is defaulted to pull in all the, dot, all the pictures from your comparables. So if you've got a comp that's got 36 pictures, it's going to pull all 36 pictures. And those 36 pictures, when you print them in PDF, fit 12 per page. So you can see that that one listing is going to cons consist of four pages, the overview and three pages of images. So it can really make your PDF get very large. You'll notice here that there are 50 pages in this PDF down at the bottom. So if I come to this particular area, this listing overview, you'll see that here's one of my comps, and then here's the pictures for that comp and more pictures. And it actually looks like there's additional pictures. And then here's the other listing overview with more pictures. So you can see that that will greatly enlarge the size of your P. In order to prevent that from happening, if you'll click on this little edit pencil, you notice that you've got the ability to turn the photo select section off completely but if you still want them to see some of the photos, you can drag this little slider over. Currently, it is set at unlimited. If I drag it over a little bit, you'll notice that this number goes to the number of photos that it will include. Boxy has told us that 12 photos fit per page. So if you want to ensure that each of your comps is only two pages, an overview page and then a photo page, adjust this to 12 or less, or even make it zero or one, and it will eliminate a lot of those extra pages by doing that. So if I did that and recreated that PDF, you would see that it was going to be less than 50 pages like we originally created. The next, uh, the next option down is our side-by-side -side comparisons. That's literally what it is, a side-by-side -side comparison that is interactive on the web view so that they can page through the different comps that you have selected and compare them side-by-side -side based on selected criteria. A good way to quickly look at different comps and get an idea of how they differ from your subject property. This also has a settings pencil or an edit pencil. And if you click it, it gives you the ability to have some control over what you show in these particular areas. So here in the listing section, I can choose from all of these. Here in the pricing section, I can choose from all of those. Features, same way. Neighborhood, same way. So you can see where you could actually shorten the columns in this side-by-side -side comparison to things that might be more important for your client to look at um, if they've got particular things that they're paying attention to. The next window you have is your status comparisons. And this compares the pendings and the comparables and gives you some quick reference information based on your subject property, your pendings, and then your sold. You also have an edit pencil here, which controls some of the things that show on this particular area. You've got the ability to select or deselect whatever you want to show in order to make this a little more user friendly because it actually goes out further than what it shows here on the screen. And in the interactive version, your customer will have the ability to scroll through these different things. They can again click on a particular comparable. It will open that comparable. They can look at it. 
And all of these comps are constantly updated from MLS. So if one of these pendings winds up sold, it will move for you. You don't have to go back and update it. It's all dynamically linked to MLS. So just know that the information that your client's going to have every time they log in to look at this presentation, if it's the web version, is going to be the most up-to-date information on the selected properties that they can possibly see. That's going to be, a, that's a very good thing because you don't have to keep recreating this every, you know, every couple of weeks or every couple of days. They can go back to it and see it in a dynamic way and how it's changed and updated. The next thing you have, the next page is your listing averages. This basically just selects some averages based on the information that is delineated here. Gives you a low, average, median, and high. And it gives you the average bed size, bath size, square foot, et cetera, for the various selected properties. If you click the edit pencil, again, you've got different features that you can select to compare or deselect to. The next page in our presentation is price and days on market. You see here, it's got the various pricing and how that relates to days on market. This is not normally what you see the longer, this is not what you normally see. A higher price is normally on the market longer, but this one actually appears to be an outlier. So it'll show a trend line based on those, in, those selected comparables. So this is something you may be, uh, you may want to learn how to explain to your customer as well. But you'll notice if you hover over any of the points in this graph, it pulls that particular comp image up. And if they click on that comp Im image, it opens that particular comp and gives them the ability to look at it again in a different way if they need to. Your price and days on market edit pencil. Does it display the subject property? Yes or no. Does it show the trend line? And on the print version, does it put the page number of the listing or corresponding print, um, the corresponding comparable in the little dot? So say this was on page 12, there would be a 12 there so that they would know that go to page 12 in the print version. The next page is your price and size comparison, price and size comparison. And what this does is just relates size of property to price. And it gives you another ability to edit, whether you want to show a trend line, whether you want to show the subject property, and again about that subject reference, um, that page number, and whether it's put here in the zero. You'll notice that this one did not put a trend line. I do not understand why. That's something that I'll make a note of to send to Moxie that it didn't do that. There may not be enough data for it to determine that with this, but just know that the trend line is supposed to be there for these properties. Again, if you go to the edit pencil, I think I just showed that. Sorry, I'm repeating myself. I don't have people in the classroom keeping me straight. Sorry. Um, the next page is pricing analysis. And this is where that range comes into play. All right, this is where your range shows your approximate market value. This is where your high and low would be, or your low and high. This is the address. Any remarks that you put in about this range would show up here. And then it would pull the pricing stats based on average sales and then based on square footage. If you click on the edit pencil, do you want to show the property photo or not? Do you want to show the pricing stats or not? Remember the net proceeds that we did? If you click on net proceeds, this is where they would appear. I didn't do net proceeds, so I've got the ability to click this X and remove it from this particular presentation. And then the very last page is your agent profile. This pulls information from your profile in Moxie. So if you don't have any information in your profile, you need to go populate it because that's gonna be what it pulls when you create your presentations. The edit pencil again gives you the ability, do you wanna display your photo or not? That's the only thing it gives you the option to do there. So it's really important that you keep the, this updated. 
excuse me, in your um, profile so that they can select from that. At this point, you're done with your presentation. You can select to view it either in web format or print format. If you click send, you've got the ability to send it to anybody that is in your engage, Moxie engage. You have the option of sending just the interactive online presentation and or the PDF presentation. If you've got somebody that you know is not going to look at the interactive version, just send them the print version. But you can default it so that it sends both. That way, if they go to look at it and for some reason they can't look at it because their web's down, their internet's down, they can still hopefully pull the, inter the PDF up and look at it at some point. You type the name of the person you want to send it to here. And what that does is it will narrow your contacts down and you select from the various contacts and it will add their name down here. So if you've got a husband and wife and you want to send it to both, you can select the different names as long as they are both separately in your Boxy Engage people area. You can type your subject line. If you want to have a greeting, you can leave that checked. Otherwise, you can uncheck it, go straight to your message. And then I always like to make sure that I send a copy to myself. That way I have in my possession readily available when I go to their house, the digital version, as well as the PDF version. If I'm using an iPad, I can pull either one up from that email that I sent from this, and it gives you the ability to have it without having to search for it as much. And when you're ready to send, you click send, and it will send it out to all of the addresses you've got here and a copy to yourself. The other settings wheel here is basically your presentation settings overall. Again, the prepared for appears here. You've got the ability to change that at this point if you've decided you want to name it differently and whether you want to display the header photos or not. Any questions about the seller side presentation? How long does it stay um, in your uh, database when you make it? Until you delete it. Until you delete it, okay. You delete it. And what I'll show you here is um, if I go back to home, it takes me to my presentations. And this is the test presentation that I just created. If I click on these three dots right here, I can email it from here. I can view it from here. I can look at the settings. I can duplicate it. I can delete it. I can archive it. I can create a quick flyer which is something that gives you a benefit of creating like a one page or a two page. Um, you can assign it to another agent or to a particular team. If you're part of a team, uh, you can assign it to the team as a whole or to another agent on your team. Um, you can also add a co-presenter. So if you want to remain as the person that's going to present it, but you send somebody else out possibly to do the listing presentation, you can add them as a co-presenter and it gives them the ability from their own Moxie present to have a copy of this that they can present to that client. I have a question, Adam. Yes. Um, when you're actually creating the presentation, um, when you go in there and do that back on the listings tab, uh -huh. there was an option to add adjustment on there. Yes. What, what can we do with that? You have the ability. Let me go back in here. Now, if I've got this presentation, I can always edit it by clicking on the edit pencil. They're very consistent with that usage throughout the software. So just know if you see a pencil, it can be edited. But if I come back into, again, it's making me do things twice tonight. If I come back into this listings area, you notice these adjustments. I can come in here and click add adjustment. And it will say remarks if you want to put the remarks for this particular adjustment. And then you can enter a positive or a negative amount to adjust that column. Then you can save it or you can save it and add another. So if you've got multiple adjustments per comp, you can enter all of them at once by going save and add another. And then when you're finally done, 
you just click save or cancel to get out, your adjustments will be listed here. And you've got that ability on all of your comps to be able to adjust those up or down depending on features that they have that your subject property doesn't. Did that answer your question? Yes, sir. Super. All right, so I'm going to go back now and I'm going to go back to my presentations and we're going to run, run through the buyer's presentation real quick. And the reason I'm going to go through it quick is because, like I said, a lot of the information is identical to the seller side. There's a couple of minor differences, and we'll, we'll touch on those when we get there. Again, you can select from brokerage, brokerage templates or your own templates, default or no, click continue, who it's prepared for. Remember your listing primary MLS. If you want to change that to another MLS, you have to do it through your profile. And it's real easy to do. It's just simply a drop down, select the one you want to use, then come back in here and use it. Okay, so this again gives you the prepared for for your subject property. It's got your MLS number, or you can enter a location or simply a zip code. We're going to enter the same MLS number that we just used. Because I know that it was a house for sale. That's the one I had chosen for the buyer presentation anyway. All right. What it does is it pulls that first picture and it pulls the remarks with that odd gap again. Remove it. And then it pulls this Enrix drive time up. Now, what this does is it gives you the ability to enter the current address of your buyer and set that as the location to calculate all of the drive time for this particular property. So just know that it does give you the ability to do that. So the next window you've got is your search. This is again where you can pull comparables to show your client that yes, this house is priced well or no, this house isn't priced well. Maybe this is where we should look at a range for an offer. Etc. Remember our filters as we did before. It's running a little slow. I'm going to come to my filters, clear my filters to defaults. I'm, I'm going to be able to create a couple of good tickets tonight for support up there. Okay. So this time it pulled our information, redo our filters, reset them to defaults. Again, do we want to see actives? Do we want to see sold on things that we're looking for for a buyer? You can do solds, you can do pendings, you can also do actives to give them a range of what things are selling for versus where that house is priced. Hey, and, Adam. Yes, ma'am. Excuse me, the defaults, um, can you change those or does that, is that something embedded in the program and everybody's default is the same? That's embedded. Everybody's okay. default is the same. Thank you. Uh -huh. Not a problem. And again, remember that you need to select your comparables that you're looking at. Remember, listings will go up each time you add one and go down each time you remove one but you have to click over the picture and hit the plus sign. Once you've got those, you click listings. Again, it pulls your listings up. You've got the ability to sort, uh, to sort them by a primary sort and a secondary sort. You've got the ability to add a custom listing. Again, if you know of a home that didn't get picked up on this, maybe it was a for sale by owner that you know of, that sold for a certain price, and you want to add that as a reference, you can do that. You've also got the ability to make uh, your adjustments like you did on the seller side. So it gives you the ability to really customize what your client sees at this point. Again, on the estimate page, it gives you a, an estimated market value. And what this did is it basically selected the lowest price out of your out of your active list to populate here. You can create a range, you can enter your own value, 
all of that fun stuff. And again, here is your listing summary broken out by the way everything, bed and bath, square footage, price, et cetera. But you'll notice here, you've got estimated closing costs instead of net proceeds. So if I click here, if you know certain closing costs based on a mortgage company that they're using, uh, percentage or anything like that, you can enter that information in here um, to give them an estimate of closing costs, just like you do with a net uh, sheet, you've got the ability to create three different scenarios um, for them to look at as well. Okay, then you come to pages, everything on here is identical, except for down here when you get to purchase costs. That is there instead of the net proceeds sheet. So make sure if you don't use that, you click the little X to remove it from your presentation. Okay, remember with your listing overview, make sure that you select 12 pictures or less. That way you don't wind up with thousands of pages in your PDF and somebody trying to print it off at home and suddenly their little Epson printer runs out of ink because they're trying to print your listing presentation. So just know that you can uh, tweak that a little bit to make it a little shorter for you. Again, you've got the ability to view either the print or web version to send it just like you did before and also to kind of preview the print or web version here. One thing I didn't say before, but is if you preview the print version here, without coming up here and viewing the full PDF, it's only going to show you one page. It's not going to show you how many pages may be underlying this particular category. So just make sure you're aware of that. Any questions of the buyer side at this point? Okay. Next thing I really want to show you is I want to show you the other option for creating a presentation called a buyer tour. You may have a buyer that's looking for a particular home uh, or style of home in a particular area. You've got default you can select from as well as your templates once you've created some and saved them. Click continue. Adam, how did you, I'm sorry, Adam, how did you get to that? I clicked create new and then selected buyer tour. And once I've got it named, again, my primary listing source, you can change it, but only through your profile. And there's a little box here that says allow notes and ratings. I would leave that checked yes or green. And the reason is because as they go through this tour, they can actually make notes about a property that they just visited on that listing, on the interactive presentation, and you can see those after they're made. So if you've got maybe a, a 30 minute break between one house and the next, and they, they were gonna run and get a bottle of water or something and then meet you at the next house. You can look at the, the notes from the previous houses. And if the next house or one down the road is identical and they said they didn't like it, then you can always go in, modify your tour. It will update it on their end and remove that property from their tour, okay? So just know that it's that dynamic and it gives them the ability to have an impact immediately on what they see. So once I click create, I think this is where you'll notice the big, biggest difference is here. The only thing that comes up on this first page is who it's prepared for and this Enrich drive time, All right? If you click on it, it wants to know their starting location. You can enter that or not, it's optional, okay? You can upload an image here. If you've got a picture of a home that you wanna put, if you want your logo to appear on there, you can put that in there and it will appear um, on the front page of the uh, presentation. The next place you go is your search window. All right, so this is where your search can really take hold. We're gonna use the MLS number we used earlier. we're going to click search and it's going to find that property for us okay now the thing is it's using that one property the best thing we can do is maybe take this 
30650, go back to location, enter 30650, then search. And what it does is it highlights the entire 30650 area and gives you everything that's active within that area. It also shows you solds as well as pendings. You go to your filters, you can actually reset your filters. You could come in here and say, I only want to see sold properties. I don't want to see anything else because I'm taking my buyer on a tour and they don't need to see anything but stuff that's active. So I can clear that and hit apply. And it's only going to show me my active properties. At this point, I can go in and I can add the properties that I want to see. Again, you'll notice listings goes up. And I've added these particular five listings. I can go to listings. And what happens is it takes those five listings and maps them for you. Okay, you've also got the ability here to add a custom listing. If there's an outlier you want to add that may be a FISBO or something like that. You've also got the ability to add your adjustments. You've also got the ability to remove all these and go back and start over. I'll remove all, click search, and go back and do this again. But one thing you can see is that it orders them in a particular way on your map. You've got the ability to change this order, and this is the order that it has them in currently. You'll notice one and two are on top of each other. Then it goes down to three, then it goes back over to four, make it maybe back to five. So maybe you want to start with five since it's the furthest out. You can slide it all the way up to the top. That makes that one. And what's now at five, we can move up to two. You'll notice how you put it in place and it drops it down. The next three and four are all practically on top of each other because they're the same property. I didn't realize that it was in there twice. And then you've got the last one, which can be at the end of your tour. So you've got the ability to reorder these and then save that order. So again, if you've got one and your, your client makes a note and says, okay, property one, we didn't like property one, but you know property five is identical to property one, you've got the ability to come into here, click the X to remove property five, and it automatically updates everything along the way. And it updates it live in their dynamic version that they've got on their cell phone and their car. So that's a really good tool to have if you're doing a buyer's tour and you're following them or leading them around. Pages, you can also do a print version for this. This is where it will put that background image. It puts your information here on the front. The listing location map. Again, this is interactive. They can click over the circle and see the different properties. You've also got the listing reference page number for the print version. Again, I would always leave those on. Your listing overview, your side-by-side -side comparisons, your status comparisons, your listing averages, your price versus days on market, your price versus size or price and size, and then your agent profile. Okay, and again, You've got the ability to view the web version or the print version and to send the web version and or the print version as well. Adam, uh, yes, excuse me, when you send this to your client, did you say that this was live interaction and you can make changes and their link that you send will update? Yes, let me pull one up. I'm going to have to reshare my screen to pull it up, but let me show you what it looks like when they get it. Bear with me one second while I get it pulled up. Okay. All right. So let me end this share real quick and then I'll share another screen. Okay, this is what they will get in their email. It will have headers on here. Uh, unfortunately, my email is cropping those headers off because of security. 
So um, it's a setting that I've got to change in my email. So just know that there would be images there. Then they get the view seller presentation. They also say I've added a print friendly version, which is where they get the static PDF. And then here it says printing this document from your browser may reduce the quality of your printout. It's recommended that you download it and use Adobe Reader. It also puts your email signature, et cetera, down at the bottom. So if they click on this view seller presentation, what's going to happen is in their browser, it's going to open this up, presentation ready, scroll down to start. As they scroll down, they'll see this presentation. And they can scroll through it, look at it. They can click on these various properties to see what they look like, just like we showed you earlier. They click up here, they click down here. So that's what it'll look like when it goes to them in, your, in their email, is it'll be a link in an email that is addressed to them with pro appropriate branding that is um, brokerage approved. And it also attaches that PDF version as well. So it's a kind of a, a nice one-stop, here's everything that I'm sending you, but that interactive presentation, no matter when they open it, it's going to always pull the most current data from MLS based on these properties that were included in the presentation. So again, if one of these is pending one day, they go back to it and it's sold the next, then that's going to basically change your numbers in the pending versus sold. But it, it will constantly keep it updated in their presentation. And how, how do you know if they have selected a property or made a note that they didn't like it? How do you get that information when they make a change? When, when you're looking at the presentation on your side, it gives you the ability to see the notes that they've entered. So you'll have that ability to see that um, in real time. You'll be looking at the presentation the same way they do for the buyer's tour. Um, let me go back to it real quick and I'll show you. So you both you both have the same link and right. they're interactive to each other? Yes. So okay. here's a presentation for the buyer's tour. They go through here, say this property. They've got this up. Okay. Where are my notes? Where are my notes? Looking for my notes, sorry. For some reason I'm not able to see them. Is it ad review? Um, see right there at the top? Yeah, yeah, very good, thank you. You saw that, I didn't. Okay, so if they add a review of a property, it'll star it in your version. So it'll be interactive. You'll see the number of stars they picked. You'll see the notes they type. They save that. And then you'll be able to see exactly what is there because this will show one review. You've got the ability to click on it and look at it. Okay, thank you for whoever piped in and saw that. I appreciate that very much. Does that help? Yes. Okay. Yes, thank you, Adam. I was just trying to figure out how the two were going to be linked together, but um, yeah, yeah, I got it. I think, I think that's a valuable tool um, when you're doing a tour and you're viewing multiple properties. Um, but, you know, some people may like a more personal approach, but it is available to you if you want to use it. Are there any questions about the fire hydrant you drank from tonight? If there are any questions, please know that you can send them to me at support at theamericanrealty.tech, T-E-C-H, and I'll get those and I'll be able to answer them back as quickly as possible. Um, some of them that lately have been complicated, we haven't known the answers, so I've had to enter tickets directly with uh, Moxie, and as soon as I hear back from those, I make sure that you get answers as well um, if you've submitted those tickets. So just know that you can send support at theamericanrealty.tech, T-E-C-H, 
And uh, that's a good way to ask me any questions if you need to. So will, it, will we still have the back agent or will this replace it or will we have both? We will have a version of back agent, but that is in the process of being finalized. Um, and it will be basically where you log into Moxie, you'll go to the hub. And when you click on documents down here, document center, it will link you and log you in directly into that back agent tool. So you will only have to log into Moxie, not everything else. We're working out all the details on that. They're finalizing the construction of the back agent replacement, and we're not sure exactly when that's going to be launched. Right now, if you click on Document Center, it takes you to the back agent login, and you have to log in with your credentials. In the future, we hope where you click here on Document Center, it will know who you are because you're logged into Moxie, and it will automatically log you into the back agent client. When you click on that. Thank you. Uh -huh. If there aren't any questions, I know we've gone over time. I'm sorry, it's a lot of information. But next Thursday, we start our website training. And the website training is going to be three different trainings that are going to build on each other. So the first one's going to be about doing the bare bones basic website. The next one's going to be about a little bit of more customization. And then the last one's going to be taking it a little further, customizing it a little bit more. So if you miss any of those, we'll have the recordings. Up. We're creating a YouTube MoxieWorks tutorial page. That way you can go to those and catch up if you happen to miss any of them. Those trainings will be next week at 2, the following week at 10, the following week at 6. So just make sure if you're coming to the last one at 6, watch the first two recordings. So you're up to speed before we get started on that last more complicated version. If there aren't any questions, I'm going to go ahead and disconnect for the night. Everybody have a good night. I hope you have a great week next week and have a great weekend off.